everyone, my name is Debbie. Welcome to my channel or welcome back. If you are new here, I am a reseller. I've been reselling for over 17 years and I absolutely love it. And now I have this YouTube channel where I share the knowledge that I have learned over the years and continue to learn. So if you are new here and would like to join me again, I have about two to three videos out a week. I have a wet sole video, usually a haul and then some kind of educational or tutorial video. If you like this type of content and would like to join me again, hit the subscribe button down below and hit the notification bell so that it will let you know when I release new videos. Today I have part three of my question and answer series. So I said I would do two more winners. If you asked a question on my reseller story video, you were entered to win $100 of free inventory and I will ship it free to you. You can pick out anything from either of my eBay stores or Poshmark closets. So I picked two more winners and Let's roll the video so you can see who the first one was. I used the YouTube random comment picker again to choose a winner when the clock turned exactly 11 a.m. Congratulations, Linda. Just email me at love2shop242 at gmail.com and let me know what you would like and where I should send it to. And Linda's question was, do you still buy Ralph Lauren at thrift stores? And I actually answered this question in part one, so you can go back and watch that if you would like the full explanation there. But I will add a little bit more to it here also. And yes, I do, but I'm extremely selective. Probably the Ralph Lauren item that I skip on most often is men's button down shirts or plain polos, unless they are in a big and tall size. And also it depends on where I am buying the items at, at the bins, I'll usually pick it up because I might only have to sell it for 12 or $14 to feel like I'm making enough money to make it worth my while. So, but I won't spend $6 at the regular Goodwill. There are certain Ralph Lauren items that can be extremely valuable and yes, definitely those. Then, okay, now we will have one more winner for today. Congratulations to Life in Connecticut. If you can also email me and let me know what you would like and where I should send it. And she has been reselling for seven months now and also loves it. So that's so wonderful to hear. I am glad that you love it. And she said, there is fear in the reselling community that you will stop finding things to resell. But then others say that you can still find things to resell almost every time you go out sourcing. What are your thoughts on that? For me, finding inventory, over 17 years and one month <laughs> has never been a problem. I have never come home and said, wow, I couldn't find anything. Normally it is the opposite. I end up with too much stuff and so I have to limit myself so that I don't get too bogged down. And I think we do live in a country of extreme excess and there are always items coming in to Goodwill, things that don't sell, things that go to the Goodwill outlet centers, the bins, and then things that don't even sell there. There are a lot of things available. Now, sometimes you have to pivot, and maybe if I only wanted to sell one certain brand and that was it, um, then, then maybe I would run out of things to find. But I go into it looking at what is there, and I'm going to work with what is there, look up comps to see if that item sells. So instead of me looking for one specific thing, I am looking at what is there and what items that are available will sell for a good price. Yes, I think there will always be plenty to sell. Now I'm going to go through and finish answering as many questions as I can before I run out of time. And then if there are still more to answer, I will create a part four. The next question is from Sierra and she said that she quit a job that she was not very happy at and now she is reselling and so I hope that you are loving it very much 
and her question was, what have you found to be the hardest part of being a full-time reseller? And I would say that is people understanding that it is a job for me. And I have had so many instances where people ask me, can you do this for me? I have to work and you don't work. And I tell them, well, yes, I do. I work from home and just that has been a constant thing. Everyone feels like my time is so flexible that I can do stuff for them that they can't do because they have a job where they have to be there. And so it ends up that at some, sometimes it makes it really hard to get enough work in when I am being constantly pulled away to do other things. I'll give you a couple of examples. One time, one of my daughter's friends had her wisdom teeth out and her friend's mother called me. They hadn't spent time together for a couple years, but she still had my phone number. And she called and she said, hey, I'm leaving the dentist office. My daughter had her wisdom teeth out. I have to go back to work. Can you take care of her the rest of the day? And so I have three kids at home, it's summer. I'm really trying to get work done. And I said, okay, she put me on the spot and I didn't know what to say. And so I did, so I ended up caring for her. Her mom didn't pick her up until like eight o'clock at night. And I thought, wow, <laughs> you know, that was kind of odd. And then I never heard from her again after that. So I felt like she just used me to take care of her daughter that day. I had another, Person, and she called me and she said her baby was sick and she needed to go to work. Could I please take care of him? And I had a brand new baby and two little ones. And I was like, oh, well, I really don't want to expose my kids to being sick and I have to work today. And she's like, no, I really don't want to miss work. Will you please take care of him? I told her no about four times. She ends up coming to my door, ringing on the doorbell and handing him to me and saying, I really have to go to work. You don't, I need you to take care of him. I was blown away by that and I wasn't happy, but I was like, well, okay. <laughs> so one thing I had to learn to do was start putting my foot down and realizing that my time was just as important as their time and it was important for me to have time for work. Another thing that's really hard is people ask me to sell their things for them all the time. And you know, I'm happy to sell one or two things, but sometimes people will take advantage of that. For instance, I had one girl, she told me she took her clothes to a resale store and she had really expensive jeans and she said they only gave her like $8 for them. And I was like, oh wow, that's awful. You can resell them on eBay for like $50. She's like, oh my gosh, I don't have time to do that because I have a job. Can you sell a couple of them for me? I was like, oh sure, no problem. She was my friend. I was happy to sell a couple of them for her. Well, she ends up bringing over two enormous trash bags full of clothes and she goes back out to her car and brings in all these suits on hangers, like a ton of stuff. I ended up working on that stuff for a month at a time when I did not, I was not in a position to be able to do that. I was a single mom. Sometimes I feel like people don't realize how much time it takes. So I ended up making thousands of dollars for her. And then at the end she said, do you know what I'm gonna do since you did all of this for me? The next time when we all clean out our closets, you can just have the stuff. That never happened. So put limits on even friends and family and let them know that it does take your time. So those have definitely been the hardest things for me as a reseller. The next one is for Lollipop Lollies. And she said, could you please talk a bit or in depth about how you handle eBay cases opened against you as a seller, especially how a new seller should best handle I-N-A-D, item not as described cases or difficult situations like buyer returning an empty box. I just had a video on this subject and the most important thing is to respond quickly. Never leave those things unanswered because they will rule in the other person's favor if you just ignore it. And call eBay and request help from them when necessary and explain the situation to them. I have never received an empty box. I have heard that people have had that happen, 
but I bet those things are on, on YouTube a lot more than the cases that end up resolved just fine because there's a lot more desire for someone to want to share when something doesn't go right than when it does go right. But I can tell you my feedback is like 19,000 and not everybody <laughs> leaves feedback. You know, probably one in 10 people actually leave feedback for me. So I have had a lot of transactions. Not once have I ever had someone return an empty box. So hopefully the odds on that are extremely low. They have been in my case, but if that were to happen, what I would do is first of all, I would contact the person. I would stay professional and I would let them know that the item was received and the box was empty. I think if I felt like it was empty, I would record it while opening and although eBay will not take that video. You can tell the buyer I opened it on video because it felt like it was empty and it was, and so this is fraud. Sometimes if you say fraud to a person, they'll back up. That's happened a couple times when I call them out and I let them know that I am absolutely certain that they are not telling the truth. This is fraud. <laughs> they have backed up on that. I would message them, tell them, they can close the case without the refund or you are going to contact eBay and pursue action. And then immediately I would go ahead and call eBay and get documentation of what has happened. If they say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, you have to refund them or something like that. I would say, can I speak to a supervisor? Because I have had other things happen and when it is clearly not fair and they say no that's i can't do anything else i ask to speak to a supervisor and there have been cases when they have given me a refund or a credit to my account when the first representative said no we can't do that so asking for a supervisor is a good idea and then also work really hard towards becoming a top rated seller because one of the protections you have as a top rated seller and I'll pop it up <laughs> is that if you offer free returns you can charge shipping to get to them but if you offer free returns then if they return it and it is not in the same condition as you sent it you can offer them up to a 50% refund. You don't have to refund them the entire amount. So say it was $50, you can only refund them $25. And then eBay will also give you a $6 credit towards the return shipping. Now, if it was something that had cut the tags off and it was a new item, well then I would definitely return a lesser amount and then I could probably still sell it as new without tax. Now, if it is so, if it is completely ruined and has a zero dollar value, I would call eBay for sure on that and explain to them that it is no longer able to be sold at all. If you want to see, I went through a, a case that I had on some dishes. I, I walked through that. So if you're interested in watching that video, I give a lot more information and tips on dealing with that. And the next one, I hope I don't say your name wrong. Is it Shaniza Osman? She asked a great question. She said, the month of June has been slow. Any feedback on if that is normal? Absolutely, for me it is. And everybody calls it summer slowdown. In the summers, I definitely am not listing as much and so I'm not selling as much. Now on summers that I have been able to list a little bit more, I see just as many sales. So I think it has to do with my activity, not with the platform's activity. And as I've been watching other resellers, I will hear them say different things like, oh, I had a great sales week. I'm not experiencing summer slowdown, but I have been listing a ton. I listed 200 items last week. Well, that's why they don't have a summer slowdown. And then other people, they'll say, oh, my sales are so slow. This summer slowdown is awful. We went on vacation. We went and did this. My kids are home. I barely listed anything. Thing. And so it is true. It is if you list, there are still buyers out there in the summer, but you have to put the work out there. Now, even when I have a lot of listings out there, normally I've maintained around a thousand listings on eBay through the years. That's kind of been my magic number. And 
even when I've had a thousand listings, if I am not putting new listings out there, things slow down. There's something about having activity on both eBay and Poshmark that creates older items that have been on there to be seen more. I don't know exactly how it works or the algorithm, but year after year after year, I've seen when I list, things sell. The next one is from Dennis, and that is my dad's name also, and my son's middle name. And he said, how many items do you list a day on each platform? And that really has changed over the last seven months since I started on YouTube. Before, I, when I was doing thrifted items, I thought about 10 to 20 items a day was a really good work day. And so that was full-time 10 to 20 items and when they are individual. Now, when I'm doing liquidation or retail arbitrage, I've had days where I can list four or 500 items in a day because of the multiple quantities. So now, now I might only be getting 20 to 30 items a week listed at this point, but that's okay because I have chosen to invest a lot more time into YouTube right now. Next one is from Nancy and Nancy said, what was your most memorable sell? And I have talked about this on my video where I was showing how to package fragile items, but I will go ahead and say it again really quickly. And I had all these super expensive items from a lady that I spent about a year working on to resell for her. And the very last thing that I listed was this old um, bottle opener and it looked worn and just I thought this is not even worth it. This is just silly to list it. This is going to waste my time. But it was a brand called Chrome Hearts and apparently they're a designer for the stars. Well, I listed it low. It was, I think, probably 99 cents. It's hard to remember now. It's been quite a few years and it got bid up to hundreds and hundreds of dollars. It was so exciting. And then I realized, huh, this is something. And then I researched it and found out that it was this, this designer in Los Angeles. That was definitely the most memorable, exciting sell. She had a lot of really neat things, but that one just really stands out more than any other. Then the next question is from Miss Rosa and she asked, what item did you make the most profit from? And probably some of those items that I sold for that lady, um, I made a really good profit on a lot of items from that, but on items that I sourced myself, it was um, some Ralph Lauren leather jackets and they, I got them for about, they were around $200 each. This was like 10 years ago. And so that was a pretty big chunk, spending 200 each on these coats. And the retail value on them though was like $800. I put them all out for auction and they all got bid above retail value. I can't remember exactly now, but pretty close to around $1,000 each. So that was really exciting and that is probably my most profitable sell. And the next one is from Terry and she said, do you find enough inventory thrifting or do you use wholesale? Well, absolutely, I could full-time just do thrifting and I know that could keep me busy and I would have plenty, but I do use wholesale also and I've talked about it on a lot of my videos. Um, the only liquidation place that I've ever purchased from is Fox Liquidation and I was purchasing from them before I started on YouTube or anything and they actually, I reached out to them, they didn't reach out to me and I asked them if I could get a code if any of my viewers would like to buy because I love them so much so they gave me a discount code and if you want to order from them it will give you a five percent discount and it will give me a little bit of a credit also so I would appreciate that so much if you do want to use them but they are wonderful and a lot of times things come in multiple quantities and they're pre-packaged they're perfect so listing wholesale is so quick and easy and it can be very profitable Okay, now I have to apologize to Kylie in my first 
video, she had asked me a question and I said the wrong name. I looked down because <laughs> I have my questions. And so I looked down and I read it as Kelly. And then today I was going through and figuring out which questions I needed to answer still. And I realized it said Kylie. So I'm so sorry, Kylie. <laughs> I apologize for saying Kelly in the first video. The next one is from Cynthia. And she asked if any of my kids resell on their own and she has little ones and is trying to show them the value that can be found in thrift stores. And that is one really wonderful thing that I love about reselling is it really, my kids now, they love going to the Goodwill or the thrift store for me. Just a couple days ago, I did not need to buy any more inventory. I had so much. And so I asked Morgan, what do you want to do today? <laughs> and she's like, let's go to the bins. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so she, so any of my kids, they're, it really helps them see, I think, the value of money more. And when I was buying things retail arbitrage for a long time and things were on clearance, deeply marked down, they really took note of that. And then they would notice when we were shopping and things were full price, they'd say, well, let's not get it now. It's going to be marked down later. And so it helped them really learn the value of money. Sydney, my middle daughter, does resell on her own. She sells on Poshmark on my Love to Shop 2422, my smaller Poshmark closet. Morgan used to, before she was of working age where she could go work on her own, she did um, list on eBay a lot and was great at that, but not anymore. Jason has never been interested in reselling on his own. Then the next one is from Toby. She said, my questions are, how do you deal with bad buyers? And what I do with bad buyers is I'm always polite and kind and professional. And I try to remind myself to not take it personal. And I do not get in long drawn out conversations with them because some of them can write a lot. I just stick to the main points and I also am sure to remember that if this ends up escalating, then an eBay representative will be reading what I put and what they put. So I think just always remain calm and professional and then I will go out for a run afterwards <laughs> if it really is getting to me because running is an excellent, excellent stress reliever. Next one is what really annoys you about reselling. Well, that is easy. Number one, when someone lies, <laughs> I do not like it when people lie. That makes me really upset when they are untruthful and number two when someone asks me all these questions and for measurements and will you try this on and tell me how it fits like this and what is this fabric and can you measure it from here to here I know you already have five measurements but I want six seven eight nine and ten and I spend all this time and I give that, them all that information and then I never hear from them again. I think they should have at least said thank you <laughs> or, oh, you know, I appreciate you giving me all that information, but I decided against it. So that's kind of annoying to me when I put a lot of time and effort in and then they get the information, don't buy it and never say another word. So, but that's silly. I should just move on and go for a run. <laughs> this is a good stopping point. So I will definitely have a part four because I still have more questions to answer. So thank you so much to everybody for watching and for providing such great questions for me to answer. And if you enjoyed this video and received any value from it, if you would give me a thumbs up, I would appreciate that so much. Thank you very much for watching and everybody have a great rest of your day. Bye. Thank you.